Greetings and salutations and welcome to Colin's Last Stand, the independent, fan-supported show dedicated to our shared love of politics, history, knowledge, and free thought. Thank you for being here with me. I hope you're well. Today, I want to regale you with a fascinating story from World War I, one you may have never heard before. World War I, also known as the Great War, raged from 1914 to 1918. It was, as it was described at the time and for a brief moment thereafter, the war to end all wars, the single bloodiest four-year period in human history up to that point. Thing is, this story doesn't take place on mine-littered battlefields or in gas-clogged trenches. It doesn't even involve a single firearm. It's the story of a diplomatic cable that could have changed the course of the war. It's the story of an offer from Germany to Mexico having to do with the United States, intercepted by Great Britain, and known to history as the Zimmerman Telegram. World War I is a complicated affair, and I won't get into how it ended or even much about what caused such a monumental conflict to occur in the first place. Instead, let's focus on the status of the war as it was in late 1916 and early 1917. Great Britain, France, and White Russia, along with a cadre of allies, had been fighting Germany, the Ottoman Empire, Austria-Hungary, and their alliance for a few years. The war was churning through an entire generation of young men, yet little had been accomplished. By the end of 1916, the war was in a sort of stasis. Lots of activity, sure, lots of bullets hurling around, bombs exploding, and gas choking the innocent, but very little of practical importance was getting done that would decisively end the war in one direction or the other. At this point, the eyes of the world were firmly fixed on the United States, a country that had long preached neutrality and isolationism. The Allies, helmed by Britain and France, knew that if they wanted to significantly increase their chances of winning, the United States would need to get involved in the war on their side. Russia was on the brink of revolution, and if and when it fell into Bolshevik hands, a vacuum would be created that only a relatively unscathed and powerful country like the United States could effectively fill. The Allies' enemy, the Central Powers, were led by Germany, and they too had their eyes on the United States. Germany and its allies knew what Britain and France already did. The United States getting involved in the war would likely hasten Germany's demise. Germany's plan in this regard was twofold. First, the country would begin to indiscriminately target vessels in the Atlantic Ocean and elsewhere with its nascent yet incredibly effective submarine fleet. This is known to history as unrestricted submarine warfare. Knowing that attacks on American shipping and merchant vessels headed for Europe would undoubtedly draw the ire of the United States and likely get them officially involved in the conflict, Germany had a second plan. Distract the United States on their southern border so that they'd have to choose whether to protect their own land or someone else's. To achieve such an end, Germany decided to open up a diplomatic channel with Mexico. Mexico, as it turns out, had an axe to grind with its northern neighbor dating all the way back to the Mexican-American War which occurred from 1846 to 1848. The United States decisively won the war against a blatantly inferior foe, and adding insult to injury, the United States annexed a massive portion of what was, at the time, the northern end of the Mexican Republic. In return for some cash to settle some outstanding issues between the countries, the United States expanded its territory with the biggest swath of land since Thomas Jefferson's Louisiana Purchase. Current-day Texas, Arizona, New Mexico, California, Utah, Wyoming, and Colorado are either partially or entirely made up of the land the United States took from Mexico on the eve of the American Civil War. Germany figured that this likely remained a sore spot for the Mexicans, and decided to use that as leverage to get the Mexicans into the war, distracting the United States long enough that it would be a non-factor in the greater European conflict. In return, should Germany win, the Empire promised to allow the return of the land Mexico lost to the United States at the end of the Mexican-American War. And so, on January 16, 1917, German Foreign Minister Arthur Zimmermann created a telegram aimed at Germany's chief diplomat in America, Johann von Burstorff, who was then to relay word to Germany's diplomat to Mexico, a man named Heinrich von Eckhardt. But things immediately went pear-shaped, because neither von Burstorff nor von Eckhardt ever received Zimmermann's message, at least not until days after their enemies had already translated and read its contents. Instead of finding its way straight to the intended recipient, the message ended up in the worst possible hands for the Germans, British intelligence. As the BBC points out, telegraph cables leaving mainland Europe were trifled with and otherwise hampered, forcing Germany to use neutral telegraph lines to get its messages out. This left them completely susceptible to interception. The so-called Room 40, the British intelligence and military's elite group of codebreakers, made quick work of the German cipher, at least in part, but didn't immediately alert their American counterparts as to the nature of the telegram. The telegram was otherwise allowed to reach their intended targets unmolested, 
mostly because, as the BBC says, the data was collected in an ill-begotten fashion on cables the country didn't have open authorization to be spying on in the first place. Before we go any further, here's what the telegram said in full, as sent by Zimmerman to his aforementioned diplomats, ostensibly for their eyes only. Quote, On the 1st of February, we intend to begin submarine warfare unrestricted. In spite of this, it is our intention to endeavor to keep neutral the United States of America. If this attempt is not successful, we propose an alliance on the following basis with Mexico, that we shall make war together and together make peace. We shall give general financial support, and it is understood that Mexico is to reconquer the lost territory in New Mexico, Texas, and Arizona. The details are left to you for settlement. You are instructed to inform the President of Mexico of the above in the greatest confidence as soon as it is certain that there will be an outbreak of war with the United States and suggest that the President of Mexico, on his own initiative, should communicate with Japan, suggesting adherence at once to this plan. At the same time, offer to mediate between Germany and Japan. Please call to the attention of the President of Mexico that the employment of ruthless submarine warfare now promises to compel England to make peace in a few months." End quote. As you can see, there was a secondary objective here too, namely to get Japan into the war on the side of the Central Powers, who were basically acting at the time as a neutral country with some allied sympathies. Japan was a country who was also increasingly finding its empire-building ambitions at odds with the sleeping giant. But that's neither here nor there. The more pressing issue was Germany's renewed plot of unrestricted submarine warfare, its obvious effect on American shipping, and the fear Germany had that this would draw the states into the war, tipping the odds in the Allies' favor. So worried was Germany of this possibility that not only did it want Mexico in the war, and not only would Mexico be allowed to retake its lost territory, but Germany would even help fund the effort themselves. Pretty bizarre stuff, but equally bold. Because Room 40 didn't have much of a solution as to how it could tell the United States about the cable it intercepted without basically letting the country know that it's been spying on a ton of its cable traffic, it took more than a month for the British Empire to officially let the United States know what was going on. Woodrow Wilson, upon learning of renewed German attacks on American shipping, broke off all diplomatic relations with Germany as of February 3rd of that year. The Library of Congress suggests that Wilson learned about the Zimmerman telegram at this time, but it's unclear of if that's true. What we do know is that by February 26th, later that same month, the British officially let Wilson know of Germany's intentions with Mexico. Extremely late in February, the American press was alerted to the existence of the Zimmerman telegram, and on March 1st and in the following days, its existence was plastered all over newspapers. I mean, see for yourself, newspaper after newspaper after newspaper carried word of Germany's attempt to get Mexico to invade the United States should the United States decide to get involved in World War I on the side of the Allies. Interestingly, Constitution Daily notes that there were many in the U.S. who thought the telegram was a forgery, likely drummed up by the British to get their Americans into the fray on their side. But even more people were now ready to hurl themselves into a war they didn't want anything to do with mere months earlier. As for Woodrow Wilson, he was described as being completely incensed by the development. Not even trying to hide it, Zimmerman himself admitted to sending it on March 3rd, noting that it wasn't an overt act of war while confirming its authenticity. He's quoted as saying on the matter, quote, I instructed the Minister of Mexico in the event of war with the United States to propose a German alliance to Mexico and simultaneously to suggest that Japan join the alliance. I declared expressly that, despite the submarine war, we hoped that the Americans would maintain neutrality. My instructions were to be carried out only after the United States declared war and a state of war supervened. I believe the instructions were absolutely loyal as regards to the United States, end quote. Way later, in 2007, historians going through Zimmerman's documents even found the original draft, according to previously mentioned Constitution Daily. Even stranger, the draft had offered California not to Mexico, but to Japan, should both countries get involved in the war and the Central Powers emerge victorious. Another bizarre twist of history. By April 2nd, a confluence of developments, constant pleading from the Allies, Germany's attacks on American shipping, and the Zimmerman telegram, of course, among other issues, forced the once reluctant Woodrow Wilson to ask Congress for a declaration of war against Germany and its associated countries, a request that was granted to the President on April 6th. The United States was officially in, and Germany's worst nightmare came to life. Then again, the United States played little role in the ultimate outcome of the war. Just over a year later, the war would be over. And a year after that, Germany would sign the instrument of surrender that would ultimately give rise to the Nazis. Oh, and if you're curious, Mexico for its part publicly declined Germany's invitation to get involved in the fray in mid-April of 1917. The Zimmerman telegram, while a footnote of history and a minor event of the First World War, is nonetheless a fascinating story. 
FirstWorldWar.com relays the words of author David Kahn on the matter, who was quoted as saying in his book about code breaking, quote, no other single cryptanalysis has had such enormous consequences. Never before or since has so much turned upon the solution of a secret message, end quote. That could be a bit of an overstatement, I don't know for sure, but it sure is a tantalizing story, isn't it? A tale of what if from a war fought a century ago. Well, I hope you found that interesting. The Zimmerman Telegram has always been one of my favorite stories in history, a piece of real-time alternate history that could have led down a far different path than the one reality took us down. I hope you enjoyed it. If you want to read more about it, check out the description for a full bibliography and reading list. And until we meet again for another episode of Colin's Last Stand, please keep the feedback coming, be good to each other in the comments, and above all else, keep on learning. <laughs>